still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, uh, online since 2004, right. it's the one and only yeah. Rock and Roll Geek Show. With the original Rock and Roll Geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is Thursday, September 14th, 2023. It's 1221 p.m. when I'm recording this intro. Uh, about an hour or so ago, I just got off the phone with a guy named Chris Catalyst. Chris is a great songwriter living in England. He he had a band called the Eureka Machines. He's got a new solo album called Mad in England. And he just sent it to me, and I'm listening to it right now, and it's really good. He also played in Ghost. He was one of the nameless ghouls in Ghost. He played with the Professionals, uh, Ugly Kid Joe, Sisters of Mercy. He's played with Ginger from the Wild Hearts. I think he might have been in one, maybe a, sm a short version of the Wild Hearts as well, but I know he played on G Ginger's solo stuff. He even played with my friend Alex Kane and Anti Product. He's been around England for a while in the music scene and he's a super, super, extremely talented guy. And uh, I wish I had one eighth of his talent. I would be happy. Interview goes about an hour and 17 minutes. And I think it went pretty good. We talked a lot of rock. We talked a little bit of ghosts. Uh, you just listen to it. I'm not going to, I'm not, gonna, I don't like when I listen to podcasts and they, and at the intro, they tell you everything they talk about. Because it kind of blows the, uh, kind of like spoils it. So I'm just going to let it roll. I'm going to play a song first, though, because I asked him um, which two songs I could play. He just sent me the album. So he um, he said I could play any ones I want. But I'm going to start off with a song called Opinion Addiction. We're going to let we're going to let this song roll. Then it, go into the interview, then come back and say some final words and play another song for you. Okay, so here's Opinion Addiction. Ugh. I can't talk. Speaking at me for a day, friends. Opinion Addiction. Brand new Chris Catalyst from Mad in England is the name of the album. The only song that's been released so far is Emergency, which I played on the last Rock and Roll Geek show. So this is kind of a uh, exclusive, as they say in the biz. Here's Opinion Addiction, and I'll be back after the interview to say some parting words. <laughs>
Check, check, check. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very loud and clear. All right. Live and direct from Leeds. All right. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Thanks for coming on my show. I appreciate it. Of course, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Where, so you're in Leeds, England? Leeds, England, north of England, Yorkshire. What time is it there? It's uh, five, just gone 5, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. You have getting ready to have dinner? Um, well, funnily so- enough, I'm just having a, a small snack bar for my lunch, um, which is obviously a late lunch because I'm, I'm taking a friend of mine out for her birthday today, tonight. So I'm uh, I'm starving myself because it's an all you can eat sushi buffet. Oh, very nice. How's the sushi in England? Um, not as good as in the states, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, but um, I love American sushi. There's there's something brilliantly um, like I love sushi full stop, but American sushi they, like they smother everything in mayonnaise. Oh, really? I know it's not, I know it's probably not very um, authentic, but I really fucking like mayonnaise. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, what uh, I could get into a very long topic of mayonnaise, but the, uh, if you like mayonnaise, I suggest getting this mayonnaise called Duke's mayonnaise. It's only available in the south southern part of the United States, but uh, if you ever go back to the south, look for Duke's mayonnaise. Duke's mayonnaise. All right. All right, I'll look out for that because I'm I'm pretty serious when it comes to mayonnaise. Yeah, so am I. And Duke's is the best. <laughs> okay. So uh, the new album, it's I've only heard the one song, Emergency, which is a great tune. I really did like I it. send the album, the album over to you, Michael? You did not send it, no, but I would appreciate oh, it. If, I, wish, I thought I did. No, you didn't. Send me it, though, and let me know which two songs I can play. If, if I can play any, that would be great. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can play it, whatever you like. I played Emergency on the last episode, and I got a good response. There's a pair, I have this Rock and Roll Geek Facebook group, and there's a lot of Chris Catalyst fans. There's a lot of Wild Hearts fans. That's kind of like how a lot, uh-huh. of, a lot of people came to this show from the Wild Hearts. And then that's how I got turned on to Eureka Machines and all that. And I think, I mean, I'm going to kiss your ass for a second, but I think you're one of the best songwriters out there. So i um, looking forward okay. to hearing it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> that I do one. think that this, this album's kind of a, a big step forward in, in, in that respect. I sort of, I think it's liberating when you care less, not that I care less, but when you, not that caring less is the wrong way to put it. I mean, I'll just swear. Well, when you, uh, when you have put out a bunch of records and it's not that, and you do it more for yourself than you care less, mm. usually when it comes out the best. Well, I just think, am I allowed to swear on your podcast, Michael? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. I just think that there's like, <laughs> there's a difference between not caring and not giving a fuck. And that's two different things. Right. Like, I care about it so much, you know, um, so it's so kind of thought out and considered and rehearsed and, and, uh, the recordings always like very intricate, um, the way that I put it together. Um, but I give much, much less of a fuck about what anybody else thinks about it. Yeah. And certainly 10 years ago or even five years ago, probably, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. music. Maybe the music scene has changed a little bit, and back then there was maybe a lot of peer pressure and a lot of your uh, peers. You want you want to impress the other people that are in your uh, group of musicians and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Did you? I'm assuming you're putting this out yourself. Yes. Did I all am. all the Eureka Machine stuff was was put out by other a label or by or you guys self release it? No, we self released everything. Oh, that's good. So you get all um, the you get all the money. I don't know how much money there is. Probably not that much, but you get all the money and all the not uh, a right not a right lot, but um, you know, a hundred percent of not very much is better than five percent of fuck all. You yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> you have one other solo album, right? Two. Two other solo albums. Okay, I have the one. What is it called? I was just listening to it. There's one song in that solo album that's really good. Uh, it's called Yeah. Oh not? yeah! Oh no! Yeah! Oh no! That's a really super catchy tune. In your uh, your songs that, have. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was that's a, that was a, f- a funny one because I wrote that in about three seconds. It probably took as long as the song goes for me to write it, and it was. And I was sort of like, mm, maybe I won't put it on the record. And Dave, who mastered it for me, was like, "This song is such a banger," and I was like, "Really?" And he was like. Yeah, the chorus is this and the verses are that and blah blah. And I was like, okay. Um, I need other people to tell me this stuff sometimes. Uh, and indeed, you know, as, as time moves on, you sort of 
I've realized that is quite one of the good ones. Usually, they all, everybody says that the easy that the uh, ones that are the easiest to ride are usually the the best ones. <laughs> yeah. And, and Very often. There, there's that old cliche. This song wrote itself, man. <laughs> is, so, would, Dave, is that Dave Draper? Yes. And he he did all the ginger solo stuff too, right? He's done the last few um, ginger albums, and I think he did he did the last Wild Hearts album. Um, he's a wonderful man, uh, and he he does a great job. He's very good. <clears throat> he's very good at what he does. Um, very very good, and uh, I really hope that his career picks up in the way that it deserves to. What are you eating right now? I'm I'm just having I'm just finishing this snack bar. A snack bar, it's like nearly a, all gone. A protein like bar. A protein bar, exactly that. Okay. Are you vegetarian? I'm I'm pescatarian. Okay, you only eat fish. Um, yeah. Speaking of vegetarians and vegans, Alex Kane said to tell you hello. Oh, Alex Kane. I've not heard from him for a while. Yeah, I'm playing. I'm doing this project with him with this guy from this band called I don't know if you know about American punk rock. Uh, but there was um, this band called The Dictators, the lead singer of The Dictators. Oh, cool. Alex and I are playing with, with that guy, handsome Dick Manto. So Alex handsome said hello. Dick. Yeah, yeah. I should reach out to Alex, really. It's been too long. Yeah, he's good. You played with any product? I did for a short time, around 2006, six, seven, maybe. Did you, paint, um, did you paint your face and all that like they did? Um, with that band, I, um, I think I just wore some, I occasionally painted my face. Yeah. Um, thinking about it, I, I had a rather fetching blue lipstick that I borrowed from Milena, the keyboard player. Uh-huh. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and sometimes wore a suit and sometimes, yeah, it was fun. Is that music pretty hard to play? Cause his, his arrangements can be a little bit, uh, scr- screwy. <laughs> yes uh well alex is a screwy guy i'm sure he'll be yeah. the first to oh yes he very um, much is <laughs> but a great guy um, i love alex he it, the yeah i mean alex is um i learned quite a lot from alex really in, in terms of um you know he, he likes the things to be a certain way um again i think he would be the first to admit he's maybe not a control freak but he's you know he likes things to be a certain way and um so you know, I, I made sure that I'd learned the parts, and I, you know, it was it was a good learning experience because I think I'd, bands that I'd played in before, I don't think I'd paid quite as much attention to stuff like that. And by that point, I'd met Random John Paul from Wild Arts, uh-huh. and um, he was such a big influence on my bass playing uh, that um, I oh, copped yeah. loads of bits from from John. Oh, so you played uh, bass with any product? I did. Yeah, yeah. Was that before Claire came into the band? Claire, uh, no, Claire was Claire was uh, was in the band. She was oh, she playing guitar. Oh, she played guitar. guitar. Oh, played yeah. guitar. Oh, yeah, that's right. Toshi played uh, bass with Andy. Price that's right. Well, too. Yeah. It was Toshi, and then it was um, Marina, and then I came in. Um, but then a few years later, me and Toshi ended up playing in the professionals together. Yeah. Uh, which was, it's, it's all very incestuous, you know. That's right. Are you in the, on that last professionals album? Um, am I on that album? Do you know? Yeah, oh, yes, I am. Yeah, I've, I've, there's a couple of guitar solos in there, but I can't remember which songs. Yeah, did uh, you play? Did you play? Um, did you do get? I'm assuming you did gigs with the professionals. Yeah, we did quite a lot of touring over the last few years. Um, it was sort of right at the end of the pandemic uh, that I started with those guys. Um, that was a lot of fun. They're um, they're a lot of fun. Uh, those guys. I mean, obviously goes without saying that paul cook's an absolute legend um was, but again he's someone that likes to he likes things to be right and he wants to rehearse and he wants to make it good you know and, and tom spencer the singer um again wants it wants it to be right but like likes to bring in a little bit of chaos uh which, which is always fun one of the guys from three colors red was the other was the guitar player in that band too right chris yeah chris mccormack yeah. i i replaced chris ah, okay. um, all right they had a bit of a Bit of an incident, and uh, and I came in, but I, I think everyone's. We, Chris came to see us at. Um, we did a Christmas show last. Uh, when was that? Oh, December, obviously. And um, Chris came to that, and we all had a drink, and it was all absolutely fine. Oh, so he. Had I mean, a- I, I I never had a problem with Chris. You know, it was. The, the, I think that it was one of those things. Oh. People in bad 
Right. You know, Chris had a falling out with somebody in the professionals with Paul or Tom. Yeah, something. I'll, some, I'll do the way around. Something. Yeah, really. yeah. All the, the the English music, the English rock and roll music scene, it's a very uh, group, small group of people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, it's um, It can be quite incestuous. Um, and it's good everyone looks out for each other. And, you know, I, I so, like, yeah, I... I played bass for Anti Product, who Toshi played with. Toshi played for the Wild Hearts, who I played with a couple of times. And then Toshi ended up um, playing with the professionals, and I was playing with the professionals. Then Toshi ended up teching for me when I was playing with Ugly Kid Joe. Huh. It's, it's just one of the, you know, there'll be a point where I'm working for him, I'm sure. You know, it, it's it's one of those one of those things where, like, I think I think everyone, you know, making money in this uh, in this life is not straightforward and paying your rent or your mortgage or whatever. And especially nowadays with bills going up and everything, everyone's just, I don't think people are too proud to go, right, well, I'm going to go and be a guitar tech for a month or two months or, you know, um, just to keep keep working and not have to have a day job, you know? Are you, is that, is, or is this your sole source of income playing music? It is, yeah, yeah. Are you still an ugly kid, Joe? Yeah, um, we did... Um, we did a tour. What was that now? Um, well, I got a call because the um, basically the guitar player, uh, they were on tour in the States. I shouldn't tell you this um, because, um, well, I went, I went without a visa. But anyway, maybe I'll leave that bit out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, basically I got a call last minute. The guitar player had a, a, a real family emergency and had oh. to go home. Um, I got the call. I'd been to see a mate of mine's band on the Thursday night and got, pissed his arseholes and got this call at like three in the morning are you up um sort of and um can you be on a plane tomorrow and i was like uh, okay <laughs> so the ugly and, ugly kid joe called you up and asked you had you already known their songs yeah i played with them oh, okay. uh, for a tour in 2017 played guitar for them and then i ended up playing bass for them last year um for a uk run um, and then they were going back with Dave Fortman, who was the sort of original uh, guitar player in the States. And then, yeah, he had this family emergency. So I, I jumped in and then they had a European tour. So it made sense for me to carry it on. And we've got some more stuff coming up next year by the looks of things. And yeah, it, it, it was, um, you know, under, under some pretty terrible circumstances. It was, uh, it, it was, um, it, I was very grateful for the opportunity to jump back in the in that fold. So somebody in the guys then the guy's family die or something? Yeah, the uh the guitar player's wife, sadly. Oh bum, uh, that sucks. It was well, it was his his ex wife. Um but they had kids together and stuff, so he had to be there for his kids. Yeah. And you know, did a obviously family comes first, you know. Does Gav manage Ugly Kid Joe? That's right, yeah. Oh, okay, he, Gav lives. Does he live in UK or does he live in New York? He's in the UK now. He's been in the UK for about ten years. Okay, he used to. Ma does he manage you too? As you as well? Not you. Not to be no. on YouTube. <laughs> I'm sure he'd love to. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no. Um, Gav has um, has never. He he's always been very helpful and, and and always has good advice and stuff. But I'm sort of reasonably self-sufficient yeah. with with this stuff and you know quite happy with the little hole i've carved for myself it, you know it'd be nice if the hole was slightly bigger but um you know not at the expense of uh having to deal with people that i don't want to deal with you know gav is a good guy i like gav he, I, gav's a great guy i did a couple of, i played with ginger for a very short period of time that was when gav was managing ginger and yeah. I, I got along really well with gav what happened with him and ginger do you know um was there a girl involved? No, no. Okay, good, um, good, good. Um, the, the long and short of it, and this is off the record, they had a bit of a fallout because Gav was managing Ginger. Yeah. And then I think Ginger decided he was going to sort of manage himself. Oh, okay. And, and then, and then kind of went back to Gav and then, I don't know. It's it, it's one of those things. I, you know, I know Gav extremely well. He's a very easygoing 
Yes, and fella. ginger can be and ginger can be I'll, very easy to get along with, and then sometimes ginger can be on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, too. yeah, um, of course. And um, you know, I love ginger as well. Uh, but like, I think again, he'd be the first to admit that sometimes he's not all that easy to get along with. And um, I've I've never really fallen out with him. Uh, but um, but you know, I've I've seen people come and go, and, and incidents occur, and. You know, I think it was just their time. Like, Ginger's someone that, um, if you're working with Ginger, you have to be prepared to work very hard. And uh, I, I was always quite happy to do that in in the stints that I had with him. Um, but those stints were always sort of, you know, relatively short. Um, I could see that, like, over the course of a long period of time, that might become more difficult. I don't know if you've ever played uh, Ginger's music other than doing vocals and stuff, but his music is pretty fucking complicated to play as well. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was quite heavily involved in that 555 album. Yeah. Um, and some of those songs are crazy. Like, um, we sort of, we hit a bit of a thing with uh, me, Denzel, John Paul, and Ginger, um, where we all kind of just slotted into our roles. I, I, I always thought, um, and I'm not. I wasn't alone in this. I always thought that was a really good iteration of his band because it was just the four of us. It wasn't too busy. It wasn't too um, opiniony. Um, everyone kind of knew their role and what they had to do, and would do their homework and turn up knowing the songs for the most part. And 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 you know, we had a really good dynamic. Uh, and it's a shame that we never did any more with that, really, because I, I always thought we would. And, you know, who knows, we might do again. Um, that period of Ginger's songwriting was, was a high point in his uh, creative period to me. Uh, that, uh, the Velo de Corazon, was, was a good period as well. <clears throat> yes. Um, the, uh, the, the 555 stuff, and the, we did Albion shortly after that. Yeah, that which was I good, too. Never, I know that's not everyone's favorite, but I really like a lot of stuff on that. Yeah, I like that as well. It's, I, I feel like that album was sort of a a product of a, a lot of cooks. Um, and um, uh, and I wouldn't say that the, all the cooks spoiled the broth because I still really like that record. But I think it could be more uh, streamlined, shall we say. Um, it's, um, there's a lot of it, which, which again, really appeals to me. Um, I, I like stuff that's dense and weird and off kilter, but yeah, me too. It, it's not it's not for everyone. Um, but I like a lot of stuff on that record, and yeah, I mean, I we did that solo band for quite a few years, uh, on and off, with Ginger in various iterations. When it was the what was it seven piece, six piece band uh, with what? Dory singing, and uh, and then the four piece thing with John and Dens, um, and various you know states in between um and it was good man it was it was it was good fun some really good like you say some very uh interesting tunes that uh, denzel guy is a great drummer too oh yeah denzel's ludicrous what is he um, doing now uh i still speak to denzel uh time to time he's the last time i spoke to him he's working with uh sort of um, I don't want to, I don't know exactly, I don't know exactly, but he's working with kids and like helping them express themselves through music, I think. Um, and he's also making, uh, he's making a documentary, huh. um, himself, which he's hoping to, uh, maybe put out at some point. Um, he's an interesting guy is Denzel. He's, he's had, a, he's had a very interesting life. I played He's Ginger. I played Ginger's birthday party, one of his birthday parties, a long time. And, and Denzel was the drummer. Mm. He, well, Batters became and played some songs too, but Denzel played. I think played most of the songs. And man, that guy was a fucking good drummer. Yeah, yeah, he's ludicrous. And as is Rich, though, on a very different end of the scale. I mean, Rich Batsby is one of the best drummers I've ever played with. Yeah. Just his feel and his. Oh, he's a powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely. Just I can watch him play drums and he, all night. He has this. There, he almost invented that. Uh, I call it the Battersby roll, which is that that powerful uh, bop, 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 that what, that he played that he does on the Wallards. It's just really cool. I heard yeah. that, 
do you know anything about a new Wild Hearts that Dinger's doing? I don't. Um, I heard I, that he's got a whole new band. Yes, I've heard that too. Uh, I don't know anything more about it um, other than I'm not involved. <laughs> yeah. How can um, how can it be the Wild Hearts without CJ? Or, I, I can see without Batters because he's done it without Batters before. He's done it without CJ too. But those guys, are, those two guys are a very important part of the Wild Hearts to me. Well, I mean, speaking as a as a fan, which I am, yeah, me too. Um, I, I, you know, I I don't disagree. However, uh, you know, I I do think the Wild Arts has been a, a lot of things over the years, and um, there's been a lot of people in there, um, and the one constant has been Ginger. So it's it's difficult to say really without hearing it. I mean, if 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 he puts out a record and it's kind of like drum and bass inspired. Uh, Bangra, then I'm like, it's not really very wild artsy, but I, you know, I, 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 it's difficult without hearing it, but um, yeah, depending on who it's going to be, I suppose. I mean, I, I think if I was him, I'd be more inclined to put it out as a ginger wild art band thing. Yeah, that's what but, I would think. But you know, it, he's he's heard the stuff and he knows who he's got in. Um, I've got an inkling of who it, who it is, actually, if, if truth be told, but um, I don't want to jinx it. So, is there, would it be will Wild Hearts band fans be uh, happy about that inkling? Uh, I would imagine so. Yeah. So I would. I'm going to guess it's John Poole on bass. I wouldn't be able to say the way. I, I actually don't <laughs> don't officially know. Is the truth? Yeah. Well, I, I I hope the best for it, but I like CJ. I think CJ is kind of like the heart and soul of that uh, the, that band. Well, he he CJ brings a certain thing. Well, this is the thing with the Wild Hearts. Like all good bands, everyone brings a certain exactly. thing. Exactly, that's it. what makes the Wild Hearts great. And um, you know, like it, it's I, I do think CJ brought a certain thing to it, but I, you know. When they, they did a lot of a lot of stuff without CJ, that's great. You know, my, probably my favorite Wild Arts album didn't have CJ on it, uh, which is Fishing for Luckies. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, that's nothing against CJ because you know I love CJ, but you know it, the one of the issues with the Wild Arts is that you've got um, more than one idiosyncratic, more than one crazy person in the band. I'm not going to say crazy, but. <laughs> But you know, does that word yeah. that word is available? Yeah, um, that's you know that make that's what makes a, a band what it is. That's what makes a great yeah, band. What it's part of what makes a great band what it is. Well, one one of the things I was reading about um, the idea of bands, the best bands having like sort of two protagonists, not necessarily two front <laughs> people, but two protagonists. Whether that's Lennon Lennon and McCartney, or Morrissey and Ma, or two guys in the Kinks. Uh, David yeah, brothers. the yeah, the David brothers or you know, and, and it's that kind of energy that sort of makes it interesting and, and I you know, I think there's something to be said for that. You know, with the Wild Hearts, it was sort of all four of them. Um Yeah. And um but that you know, they're all guys that I love in uh in lots of different ways and uh, and I get on with all of them just as well as I ever did. But, you know, people fall out and you gotta move on if you're gonna if you're gonna work. Then you know. Hmm, I hope I hope Ginger and and CJ and Battersby didn't have a falling out. I know there's some things going on with. I I don't expect you to talk about. I'm not trying to get information out of you. Just having a conversation, but I know there was things going on with uh, Danny and and Ginger. Danny needed the money really bad. I don't know how bad um, CJ and Rich needed the money, but I think Danny needed the money bad. I think uh, you know just just like a lot of things. It, unfortunately, certain things have a shelf life. And, um, and and that's the same for relationships. And um, who knows? You know, I'm, I'm sure. I, th I think everyone said that they're done with it, um, or with that. You know, with that iteration. Um, but who knows what next year might bring, or the year after, or the year after that? Stranger yeah. things have happened, uh, like the Wild Arts reforming in the first place. You know, yeah. yeah it all depends on what Ginger has on his mind, because he his mind goes in a million different ways. <clears throat> of course, you know, and that's that's his biggest strength. And also, sometimes, you know, it's it's some something that I come across a lot is sometimes people's biggest strengths and the things that makes them who they are is also sometimes the thing that holds them back. And and um, you know, one of Ginger's biggest strengths is he's, he's, he's so um, 
the way his mind works. But sometimes that fights against him. And, and um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I wish I wish them, I wish him and them and, you know, the new Wild Hearts and the old Wild Hearts all, all the luck in the world because they've made some brilliant stuff. What does Battersby do besides Wild Hearts? He's a roofer. He's a very successful and huh. very good oh, roofer. He owns the roofing company. He owns the company. Yeah, yeah. Well, good yeah. for him. What's CJ yeah. do? He, I know he was. CJ's putting out a bunch of solo stuff, which I appreciate. I wish he would get back to the pop solo stuff, but it's neither here nor there. But <laughs> what's CJ do for a living? CJ's just, just doing music. Oh, yeah. And he's got, his hot, he's got his hot sauce business. Yeah, uh, that can't make up that much money. But, um, but he's, he's just keeping it, keeping it together. Yeah. Um, doing that, you know, I think he's, you know, he lives in the north as well, so his overheads aren't as much as people who live in the south. How far and, is uh, how far is Leeds from from London? It's about two hundred and forty miles or something. Oh, okay. not, not that far. It's not that far, especially by American distances. You know, when I've been, the last few times I've been playing in America, and you meet someone outside the gig, and they'll be like, "I've driven nine hours to this show," <laughs> and you're like. Fucking! If I drove nine hours from my house in any direction, I'd fall off the end. I feel the same <laughs> way. Did you play all the instruments on your on the new album? Uh, apart from drums, yeah. Who played oh, drums? A, a, a guy called Jason Bold. Okay. Um, so Jace played with Killing Joke. He played with. Um, he plays now with Bullet from a Valentine. Uh-huh. Um, oh, he's a hard he's, rock, a hard rock drummer. Well, it, he is and he isn't. He's like. Yes, obviously he is, um, but he like he'd be the first to admit that his favorite music isn't metal uh, as such. But he's just got a real talent for that, um, and he's a I, the speed with which he picks stuff up and nails it absolutely blew my mind. I, I did the last album with him, Kaleidoscopes, and we just flew through it. Uh, and he's a real nice bloke as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'd met him. He was um, he came. He was a friend of Dave Draper's, uh, and I actually put him in touch when I auditioned for Ghost. He came with me and auditioned on drums, uh, and decided it wasn't for him, and then was doing Bullet anyway. Um, and but we just kept in touch. And when the time came that I, I needed someone to record some drums, he was. He was there, and uh, yeah, nice, nice guy, and an un- unbelievable drummer. I'm really lucky to know some incredible drummers. Did you play all the other instruments? Uh, apart from a bit of trumpet, which uh, my mate Nick Hughes from the Middlenight Men played, he's another brilliant fella in a brilliant band, and um, some keyboards, which Brian Scary played, uh, who I met through Victoria from the Ginger Band. Uh, that's that's uh, Gav's girlfriend or wife, isn't it? Wife, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you record and yeah. did you do the record in a studio or just the drums in a studio? Um, we recorded the drums in the studio, and then I I, I recorded everything else at home, um, all the guitars and everything, and then we were going back into the studio to do the vocals, um, and that's where like. Just before that was when I got the call from Gav saying, can you come and do this Ugly Kid Joe tour? So I took with me a setup. I took my laptop and a interface and a microphone and bits and um, and did most of the vocals for that album in like meeting rooms in hotels and oh, right. blagging blagging rooms in hotels and all sorts of stuff just to, just to get it done and then desperately using their sort of very slow Wi-Fi to transfer stuff across. And And it was very much like we were up against it and I was just doing stuff on days off. Oh, you had a deadline on this thing? Yeah. um, Who sets that deadline if you put it out yourself? Well, I do. um, Based around kind of other things that I'm doing, Uh other things I've got in the pipeline. and, And it was also based around Dave... Draper's availability because he's quite busy and basically if we moved the session that we had he didn't have any more time until whenever it was three months later so it was a bit like shit or get off the pot you know (laughs) so we just had to do it and I've made a bit of a career out of um, getting things done at, at all 
cost, really, <laughs> but, but but at low cost as well. Are you married? <laughs> I'm not. No. Yeah, you live with a girlfriend. You live by yourself with your mom. I don't. I live. I live. Uh, I live by. Well, I've. I've I live in my house and I, I've got a, 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 a housemate, a lodger. Okay. Um, you own the house? I, I do, yeah. Wow. The Eureka Machines pays well, huh? Well, it was, to be honest, the it was because I've lived with the Sisters of Mercy for a long time. Uh -huh. and, um, and that was kind of what gave me a deposit, you know. Um, and, uh, I, that you know, and then like other jobs, I was guitar teching for a long time. I worked for, I was CJ's guitar tech for the Wild Arts for quite a while. Huh. I did OMD and Maximo Park and Skid Row and Ugly Kid Joe. That's how I met those guys. So it's not as if I've just you know, I, I certainly couldn't have bought, bought a house out of Eureka Machines. Skid Row, the uh, American Skid Row, or Gary Moore Skid yeah. Row, American Skid Row. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What kind of venues did Ugly Kid Joe play? Um, the most recent UK dates were kind of like the academies, and you know, playing fifteen thousand to fifteen hundred. Oh, large, some, some large, small. Cl large clubs, small theaters. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's good. Good for them. I didn't think they were that big. That last album was pretty good. Are, are you on that album? You're not on that album, right? I'm not, no, but it's, I think there's some great stuff on. On the last couple of things that they've done, I think they get kind of tarred with this sort of slightly comedy metal right, brush. Right, you know, that one song. Yeah. Cause exactly, you know, which was a, a kind of a joke song anyway, as, as is often the case. The, the one that they took out becomes the hit, you know. Um, but actually, you know, those guys are really into their music. And there's some great stuff, I think, on the last couple of records. Um, yeah, I think that might have been in my top uh, 10 or 15 albums. I do a top 10 album thing at the end of the year and mm. it ends up being like 15. I think it was, I made it, I think it might have made the list. Mm. What kind of, what's that, yeah. what kind of gig does that pay for a hired gun guitar player? You, you, I guess you considered yourself a hired gun, right? Um, well, I never did really. I've, I've always, um, I never wanted to be like what, you know, what they call a session musician. I'm not good enough to be a session musician. I'm not a good, I'm not like a shreddy kind of a player or anything like that. I'm pretty good rhythm player and I'm, and I'm diligent. I pick stuff up quickly and uh -huh. I always do my homework. I'm quite sort of professional about things where right. I can be, but, but I'm certainly not someone that could read music or, or, um, or just sort of, you know, someone says do a shreddy minute long metal solo on this. Like I'm, I'm lost straight away. Any anything past about the eighth fret, I'm I'm not really interested. Right, I, I was always sort of interested in kind of chords and and what's interesting voicings of chords and um, putting chords together that sort of clash in a nice way and just you know. A, a more kind of song songwriting based approach to music. That's all I ever wanted to do was write songs. Um, I wasn't really interested in playing sort of flashy solos. So I never bothered to learn all, all that stuff. And, and, you know, it's great hearing that stuff when people do it well, but it sort of never really grabbed me. Um, I was more interested in songs and, and riffs, you know? Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, you know, I, I never would set out to be a, a session guy. Every band I've ever played with, um, I've kind of thrown myself right into, uh, in order, you know, because that's who I am and, and that's that's what I do. And that's backfired in the past because, you know, it, it turns out that other people don't maybe feel the same way about you or, or, or about the band or, or whatever. And, you know, that's okay. It's just part of the learning curve. But, it's a kick in the knackers when it happens, but you know, I, I sort of refuse to change that because same with ugly kid Joe, same, same with every band I've ever been in. I sort of feel like I want, I want to be in a band. I've always, I've always believed in being part of something that's, that's bigger than myself. And, um, I think that's important. Uh, well, that's called a not, team player. Well, I think so. It's, it's not about a paycheck or clocking in and clocking out. It's like living it. You know exactly. And um, if if somebody like Ugly Kid Joe or or another band calls you up and wants you to jump on a tour, how long does it take you to learn their set? Well, it really depends on the band. I mean, the 
you know, with no disrespect to anybody, um, the the professionals material was sort of a lot more straightforward to learn than say the ghost material or the um, ugly kid Joe material for that matter. It's, it, you know, you kind of know where it's going. Um, but you, you know, you can sit and pick it apart. It's one of my favorite things to do. If, if I've got a, a gig and I've got to learn a few songs, whether it's for a, a band that you've heard of or a mate's band where the bass player's gone away for the weekend and they need someone last minute. I love sitting down and working stuff out. It, it sort of scratches an itch in my brain that that kind of it's the same it's the same kind of dopamine hit or itch that gets scratched that that I get when I put together a piece of like flat pack IKEA furniture. It's like it's like a puzzle and you and you sit and kind of lay out all the pieces and go right where, where how am I going to do this? And then it, it gradually starts fitting together and you're like, oh, okay, right. And, and then you come to another bit and it's like, oh, I've already done that bit, so I know how to do that really efficiently. And then and then you can kind of lay it all down and look at it all and go, right, and then that goes here and that goes there. And I've finished it and and I know it now. And and for some reason, like, I've, I'll forget. If I, re, if I watch a film, the next day I've forgotten what it was about. But for some reason, songs just stick in my head. Do you um, like? Do you write down uh, tabs and stuff and bring them to the gigs with you if it's a band that you're not that familiar with? Yeah, sometimes a bit, but like it's um, generally just because I'm scared of forgetting. <laughs> you know, just, just generally sort of scared of having that brain fart where it's like, shit, how does this go? <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, um, and sometimes some band, a lot of bands. Their music, the songs are a lot similar to each other, and you can get songs confused. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of terrifying. Yeah, like you know, like for instance, and people say ACDC, all that music's so easy, but if you're playing, if you're trying to learn a set of of fifteen ACDC songs, you can get uh, one song confused with the other one extremely easy, and that's embarrassing. Oh, it's the same with Ramones. I remember yeah, talking to exactly. Alec actually about, about Ramones stuff when he was yeah. playing with Marky. And he was like, it's so much more complex than you think because I think because they weren't kind of what you would call, you know, trained musicians, you know, I, I generally do things in twos and fours and eights, whereas Ramones would do things in fives and sevens. Yeah, a lot of bands are like that. Not Not because they're trying to be tall, but because they're, that's just. They weren't the, thinking in fours. They were just, they just yeah. played it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I always thought that was quite interesting. So how did you get that ghost gig? You were one of the name, <laughs> people, for people who don't know, you were one of the quote, nameless ghouls in ghost. For how long did oh, you play that? How long did you have that gig? Six years. Did you do the Iron Maiden tour in the States? I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was at 20, that. I was at that show. Yeah. It was fun. That was, um. Yeah, they were good guys. Um, it was a, it was a, that was a good tour. That was an interesting time. Um, and made and a just you know we'd, we'd watch them most nights and yeah. it it was. I'm I'm not an Iron Maiden fan. It's it's a little bit World of Warcraft for me. It's a little you know it's it's just it's just not my not my scene really. There's, there's not a lot of punk in it. Right. Um, actually seeing it live. Um, I mean, they're an absolute force. I went to see them, actually. I took my girlfriend's dad uh, to see them in Leeds recently. And so bearing in mind, we saw him in 2017 quite a few times. Bruce was just getting over cancer. Right. And he was running about the stage and he was, you know, I, I felt like I could tell he was straining a bit with his voice. But, you know, it, it was un unbelievable to see this guy who just got over cancer doing all this stuff. I'd never seen them before that. Or if I had, it had been when I was pissed at a festival or something. But I went. I took my girlfriend's dad to see them uh, in at Leeds Arena recently, and they were next level. The the best thing about it was that that was a bunch of people that you could tell were absolutely buzzing to be there. The the band, I mean, and the audience, but you could tell they were having such a good time. Yeah. He sounded better than ever. Um. And, you know, they were, they were doing a lot of stuff from their new album, which I'd not heard, but, you know, it sounded great. And 
they're just they're just a force, you know. Which is why you get to do it for forty years, you know. How did you do? How did you get the a ghost gig? Oh right, sorry. Yeah, you asked me that. <laughs> um, so basically, their produce a, a, a guy who they worked with, Tom Dalgay, uh, put me in touch, and that was, and you know, I had to do a little video, and that was that. Um, so you you filmed yourself playing their songs, or just playing? Yeah. Did, did they give you some yeah. songs to play along to, or? Yes. Yeah. So I um I did these. I think it was just one song, and um, I had a long conversation with the boss, and you know we got on, and we went and did a a rehearsal, and you know went from there. Really, it was you know it was quite it was another sort of serendipitous um, happening. I, I'm 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 not a believer in fate particularly, but um, sometimes things happen at, at just exactly the right time that you need them to. There were about, let's see, wait, one, two, three, four, maybe seven musicians in that band or something like that when I saw you guys open for Maiden. How many people were in the band? So there were, at that time, there would have been six, I think. Uh, one sec, one sec. You guys uh, all played those same guitar shapes, which was shaped like a Gibson RD. I don't know if those were RD artists. but No, they, they, the Hag, Hagstrom Phantomans, yeah. Oh, okay, but they're shaped like the Gibson RD. Did they, did the band, what's that? Go ahead. Yeah, there's there's sort of a similar thing. I, I I have to be a little careful with what I say about ghosts because uh, so, I am supposed to. Pre, it's supposed to be a secret, but right. I I won't I won't say anything that like you know isn't all already kind of known generally. And I'm you know I, I was sour about how it ended, but I'm not here to badmouth people. And life goes on, and they're in a good place, and I'm in a good place. And so you how know. did it end? <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay, <laughs> it was no. fight between somebody or just fight? Just he went in a different direction. I, I don't. Okay, you don't want to talk about. It. I'd really like it, to know it, though. It's <laughs> like I mean, you know, I could tell you at the end, but um, it was uh, you, you know one, one of those me. things. They've they've um, they've moved on, and like I say, you know, it's it's like when you split up with a a, a, a partner, you know. Maybe it hurts at first, and you know it always does. But then you look around later on, and you go, "Actually, you know, they're doing great. I'm doing great. Things are different." But you know, back no to, one's lost. Back to those guitars. Did they? Did they <clears throat> have those guitars already? They own all those guitars. Or that, I don't yeah. know the Ghost organization. They owned all the guitars and said, "You got to play this guitar." Yeah, yeah. So they're the Ghost signature guitars that um, Tobias and Martin from the band, uh, from the band previous to me had designed uh i believe and um hagstrom make great guitars and they're really nice people uh and, and they put this guitar together as the the ghost signature guitar and huh. and it and it proved i think a lot more popular than they were expecting yeah they're kind of cool. i mean the gibson rd artists those are that's a cool shape it's a little bit like a fun firebird or a thunderbird yeah How i've got a bit of a funny thing with those sort of guitars like I, I really love guitars that look like they were invented by someone that was trying to predict what a futuristic a, a guitar in the future They're would look kinda like. Kind of like cars, cars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like cars uh, back uh, in the sixties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why Leo Fender. Um, Leo Fender never played the guitar, you know. Um, he he just. Um, I think that's right. Uh, but he he loved cars. Yeah, he, there's the, the paint all, jobs on those guitars were car paint. That's right. They were all car colors, like um, that teal, apple that, red, that teal yeah, green. Yeah. Um. Uh. But I, I love like like the Ibanez Iceman. People often right. say like, ask me if like I'm a Kiss fan, uh, which I'm not especially. I just love that guitar. I, I just think it's a mega guitar. Um. And the same with the. Gibson RDs and the Phantom and and and, and like uh, the Firebird and stuff. I, I just feel like someone in the sixties or even earlier maybe was going right. What what would look futuristic? What would the kids with a Z like to see yeah. in like nineteen eighty seven? So I'm going to design the Firebird, and then it comes out and it's like it just becomes this classic, you know. Yeah, a, a flying V. How would how who how would yeah. you invent the, a guitar shape like a V? <laughs> yeah, too right. 
It's just, it's, I'm going to shape something that's going to look like it's flying through the air like a rocket ship. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got the upside down ones. And yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that's they're, uh, crazy. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's a guitar that I've never owned as a flying V, but I fancy one one day. So when you got the the ghost gig, they you didn't have to bring any gear. They, they they supplied all the amps and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. What are their what's the amps consist of? You, I'm guessing it's probably something like a modeling type amp. Yeah, uh, it was again I'm 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 not revealing anything that's not yeah, already yeah. out there. We were using Keep um, in mind I'm not a I'm not a big ghost fan or trying to or I'm just No, 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 of course. Out. Um it's it was all Axe Effects again. We had a deal with Axe Effects, and they're, they're really, you know, what, really good people. And, Axe, I don't know what Axe Effects is. What is that? Axe Effects. Um, Axe Effects. That's like a modeling. Effects. Yeah, yeah. Like so, do you know what? Like a like a Kemper. Yeah, like a so Kemper I, type thing. I've got. Um, I use a Kemper at home. I really love it. Um, and like a lot of things, it's one of those things where, you know, some people prefer Kemper, some people prefer Axe Effects, some people prefer the Line 6 Helix. Some people prefer Macs over PCs or PCs over Macs right. or whatever. But they're all sim- they're all, sim- they're all They all sort of do the same job. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a, you know, the, um, I know people that say that Axe Effects is the best and Kemper's not as good. Um, I know people that say that Kemper's the best and Helix isn't as good. You know, it's just one of those things, really. It's just what you get used to. Um, when you play your I, own, when you do your own gigs and stuff, do you play a, do you play a Marshall or do you use a modeling thing? I use my Kemper nowadays. Oh, okay. Um, I, I used to, the reason that I bought a Kemper was because I had, I, I've, I've all, I was always kind of like valves and, you know, get some tube energy in there and, you know, all that stuff. Um, when I was playing with the sisters, all the amps that we were using both stage left and stage right were, uh, were mine. And, um, we did this European tour. I think I brought six amps out. So we had one each and then a spare each and then a couple of others as sort of extra spares, a couple of combos. And um, one by one, all of them on this tour, all six amps broke um, because, it, you know, they, they do sound great and they look great, but the most important component in the whole thing is made out of glass. And then you... You know, you're putting it in the back of a truck right. or the back of a trailer and it's rattling through the the Balkans and, and you know, on, on, on roads that aren't incredible. And so it knackers them. Um, and on that tour, one of the one of the techs with the band had got the guy from Kemper out to the Hamburg show and he brought it. And I was kind of sceptical, like a lot of people are with this stuff. Um, and... Um, I was like, yeah, but it's not going to sound like a valve amp. And we plugged it in, and within probably two minutes, I was like, yeah, I'm going to have one of these. Thank you very much. Can those things um, push a cab, push a 412 cabinet? Yeah, yeah. So you can get one that's got a power amp in. You can get one that doesn't. I got the one with the power amp in so yeah. that it does everything. Um, I Personally, I think that's what they're best at, um, you know, replicating a – an amp in a room situation. Have you the ever DI. put up Kempner and a Marshall together and closed your eyes and tried to tell the difference and not been able to tell the difference, or can you tell the difference? No, I've. Uh, so one of the first things we did when I when I bought one was uh, went up to a friend of mine's studio who had a bunch of incredible valve amps. Uh, I took my ones up, which I by this point I'd fixed. And um, and we profiled them all. So you, it basically, there's some kind of dark art to it where it plays kind of, you put a mic in front of the cab and feed it back into itself and it plays a bunch of sort of whale noises through, through the amp at nosebleed volume. Um, and, and then somehow kind of magically records the sound of that amp. Um, well, I'm sure that you can make it sound the same in recording, but I'm wondering live, if you, if you, in a con, in a go set it up in a club, would, can you tell the difference between that and a, and a tube amp? You call it valve, but we call it tubes or whatever. Tubes, yeah. Um, well, well, this is it. We, we profiled all the amps in the studio and the, the guy who owns the studio is a, a good friend of mine, Andy, um, he was real skeptical about it. It won't sound the same. It won't be this. We got him in and we were we A B'd it, which is the amp, which is the Kemper. 
he couldn't tell. And he's got really good ears. Um, we were very, very satisfied with what we achieved with them. They're they're quite amazing, yeah. Can you get, like, feedback and stuff? Like, Oh, you- yeah, it, be- it behaves exactly the same as my... I, I really love those Marshall 30th anniversaries, the 6100, and it's exactly the same. Oh, huh. okay. All right. If what, anything... What's the power? What's the wattage on the t- power amp? It's a 600-watt power amp, so it's there's plenty watt. of, you know... It's... Um, <laughs> It's, there's plenty of room in there. Um, they're really good. They're really versatile. I wouldn't say it's perfect. The, the, the um, Not every amp sounds just like the one that it's um, aping. But um, for what it can do and the effects that are built in and the, it, its capabilities, um, for a touring musician, you know, where, like, this week I'm going and doing a bit with the professionals and then three weeks later I'm going and playing bass for Ugly Kid Joe and then I'm doing a studio session for my own stuff. And you can stick you know, your amp in your covers. suitcase. You don't have to. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. covers everything. Uh, when, well, Alex uses some kind of modeling thing too. And when we did this Manitoba tour, there were a couple of times where he had to restart the thing and we had to wait for it to reboot. Yes. That, that happened to us once. There was a, there was a power cut in the venue in, um, one of the venues on the on the UKJ tour, and once the power came back on, it did take you know a minute for for it to reboot. But by this point, we were already singing "Yellow Submarine" or something, you know. <laughs> do you have Do you have to? Uh, I mean, has there ever been one where it's completely just like a hard drive just wiped out, and it was like no, you, never. You scared never. of that? You scared of that happening? Do you have a backup or something? Yeah, I've, I've got a backup as well. Um, but touch wood, they've always been dead stable and um, just never seem to fuck up, really. Uh, I, I love it. Um, they just look a bit silly. That's the thing. I, yeah. You know, you, you can't beat looking at a, you know, a big pile of Fender Twins or a Marshall Stack or, you know, whatever. Um, when you're playing with, like, some bands that they want you to use, a, like, a dummy head or something, like... No, I've, no, I've never come across that. Um, the only person that wants to do that is kind of me, but I just couldn't yeah. be bothered. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, not it does like look, that. it does look a little weird if you got a Marshall, a four twelve or whatever, and then you got this little tiny little thing sitting on top of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that back to that ghost. Did that singer write all the songs? Is they all his music? Um, well, he, you know, he has. When he goes in the studio, there's like a, a team of songwriters that he works with. Oh, he does. Um, okay. Um, for for the more recent stuff, at least for the last at least the last two albums, um, and I believe the old band contributed to some of it earlier on. Um, did you record any stuff? I did record? some. I did some bits on um, uh, Prickell and some backing vocals really because they were recording it in the UK and he just did backing vocals, no guitar. He's yeah. got, he's a session guys play. Um, well he does a lot of it. He's okay. a really handy guitar player. Okay. Um, and bass player. And then he, um, for the last album, he got, um, uh, Friedrich from, um, Opeth to play a lot of the lead guitar. I mean, he's insane. Okay. Um, I'm not, like, I'm not that familiar with the metal stuff, but yeah, I'm sure he's great. He, he's like a proper shredder, but like an interesting shredder with it. You know, like he's got some really, really good ideas. But, you know, both on that album and the Opeth stuff, it's it's really um, it's really quite something. <laughs> when, I, when I saw Ghost open for, for Iron Maiden, um, there were a lot of tracks. At least yeah, like- well, that was that was really through necessity. Um, after that tour, actually, um we well we he hired um some backing singers and a keyboard player and and did it all live i saw him once on that I was, at the iron maiden show lead vocals were going and his microphone was by his side and the lead vocals were still going um he always sings live to be fair um the there'd be back there'd be backing you know there'd be harmonies and stuff is it hard to play with a mask on Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean it covers your eye. It can, sometimes it can slip over your eyes, and yeah. But you see, playing with the Sisters of Mercy for a long time, the first thing that Andrew said to me when I joined the Sisters of Mercy was, 
can you play your guitar? In fact, no, in fact, one of the reasons he hired me, he came to see me playing a, uh, a gig, and he said, one of the reasons that I knew you could do it is because you can play your guitar without looking at it. Um, oh, because they have a lot of dark stages and stuff, right? Yeah, and like a lot of fog. Yeah, and, it's um, difficult to see the neck. Yeah. Do you, do you and, put, and, like, glow-in-the-dark tape on your neck or something like that? Yeah, sometimes. I have done. Um, and those, like, glow-in-the-dark fret markers as well, where you... Yeah drill a bit out and put the paint in and UV light it and stuff like that. You know, there's, there's ways around stuff, you know? Yeah. Didn't, didn't you guys wear gloves in ghost as well? No. Well, I never did. Oh, I was going to say, how, I, how can you play guitar with gloves on? No, I think, uh, sometimes it might sound like I'm playing guitar with gloves on, but <laughs> I can imagine that's a pretty good paying <laughs> gig, right? I'm <laughs> That's something that I'm not going to get into that's, right I'm now. Guess, I'm going to say that's not a good paying gig then. <laughs> I'm, 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 that, that's, that would be, uh, yeah. would that be, in bre- is the right word in breach of contract? Right. Um, Are you still on an NDA? Um, I'm, I mean, to, to be fair, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of openly talk about, I think it's pretty ghost to talk about like what you're getting paid for right. things. Anyway. Well, you can say it's a good paying gig or it's not, or it's not as I good as you might think, but I, I a, a guy showed up to a man, to the, one of the Manitoba shows, uh, handsome Dick shows and his son actually took your place in ghost. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't know his name. He's an American guy. Yes. Um, I, I don't know him, but, uh, I hear he's a, uh, doing a great job and that he's a lovely fella um, from the other guys. So, you know, I wish him the absolute best of luck. So you got kicked out or you left? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. I would never have left. Right. You, you never, I wouldn't leave that gig either. Even though I'm not, a, I don't, the music's not my thing either, but if they needed a bass player, I would fucking jump on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, uh, the new album is called Mad in England. Mad in England. Coming out, October, coming out in a couple of weeks, isn't it? Yeah, October sixth. <clears throat> On your own label, what's the label called? Well, it's a it's a label actually. <laughs> it's it's Roth Records, which is um, R U F F, like a dog. No, no, no Roth. W R A T H. W R A T. Rot. 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 Records. Rot. Rot. Records. There you go. Um. And uh, it's um, uh, Wrath is, is a, a label that's owned by. Well, it's 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 an imprint really for uh, the Scaramanga Six, who I used to play with, and um, they just said that I could use the name because <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> okay, that's so the, but but you're doing this, you're you're self releasing this and all that yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, so that comes out February, uh, February, uh, October the sixth. And, um, yeah, I'm very chuffed with it. I'm very proud of it. There's it's, some good, good, like, it's a good, I think it's a good mix of kind of what I do and or, or what I have done and, like, what I've always wanted to do. It's quite eclectic in places without going too off-piste. Any, um, anything different that, like, people, your Eureka Machines or Chris Catalyst fans, is there something that's, like, um, a left turn that, or is it all... Or just yeah, there's, a, there's. I mean, the the sort of common thread running through my stuff is that I'm I'm a sucker for a, a good tune, pop tune, and a, a good pop and melody. A, yeah, and um and a hook, right. and a kind of a, a a a funny turn of phrase or a, something that makes me smile, not necessarily laugh, but makes me smile. And uh, I like to um, you know, put pl- plenty of little twists and turns in. Um, they're at the, so that, at the go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so that's all in there. But then there's also kind of stuff that I've not sort of dared to explore before. There's some quite personal, like lyrically, there's some quite personal stuff in there, which I've been getting more and more kind of comfortable doing in my in my old age. Um, and musically, there's some stuff in there that's quite, um, I'm not going to say experimental, because frankly, it's not. But um, it's it's a bit of a departure. Um, there's a lot of sort of beat uh, driven stuff, programmed stuff. Um, but again, with kind of, I like the idea of juxtaposing guitars with beats or um, drums with loom- loops over the top of them, and and kind of 
you know, I, I, I sort of think I've always been sort of drawn to quite postmodern stuff, and that's like a real postmodern kind of way of doing things, where it's sort of it's not just one thing. Um, uh, it's a bit of a collage, uh, and I've, I've always found that quite interesting because at the end of the day, like none of us are none of us are the the same none of us wake up exactly the same person every day and neither should you it's it's, it's all part of a journey and it's all part of growth and not to sound like a self-help book because well, I, I was gonna do. say speaking of self-help i was gonna say the un, un, their pop tunes and their up up uplifting sounding type of music but and melodies but um underlying there seems to be like a <clears throat> little bit of maybe depression and things like that am i right yeah i mean i think you know the album's called mad in england because i think it's impossible if you've got half a brain on your shoulders not to be uh, at the moment both politically socially it's the the whole thing is kind of everyone's sort of infighting and 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 uh and I just, I can't help but think that there's a better way. You know, everything's sort of based around competition and one-upmanship and control. And and I, and I, and I just think, you know, there's that, that guy, Andrew Tate, who's, um, there's been a couple of documents. Do you know anything about him? No, no. I know the name, but I don't know who that is, no. So he's this very sort of divisive, he was some sort of boxer or some something. He's this very divisive figure um, that a lot of young kids are looking up to. And, and he's like... The thing is, I think oh, he's wait, got a oh, point. Is, that, is he a UF? Oh, he just boxed. I think. I, wait, is that that American guy? He's got a big chin. No, he's, he's well. He's half English, half American. Um, he's he's he was a UF. No, he wasn't a UFC. He was a boxer. Yeah, I think I saw him. He just did a big pay per view fight. I think I went to see that with Handsome Dick Manitoba. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, like, he talks a lot about how all these problems in society, and which I which I don't disagree with. There are, but fundamentally i think me and him have got a completely opposing view of how we fix that um he thinks that we fix it by personal autonomy becoming what he calls strong and what he calls um uh basically it's it's all a big competition to him and i think that's the thing that's holding us all back really um i think if we work together we'll you know that'll be better for the world and for society and and for for all of us um, you know, you'd have to have your head in the sand to think that there aren't issues and problems and, and such in, in, in society and politics and, and the world. But fundamentally, competition, I don't think, is the way to that we're going to solve it. Right. You ever get writer's block? Like, um, like have trouble coming up with a song? Or is it... <sighs> what, I, what I have trouble with and this is something that I've worked on over the last few years, is I, I don't really have problems starting a song. Yeah, finishing the song. What, what I don't really have a problem finishing the song. It's the bit in the middle. So the bit where you're like, you start a song, you've got a bit that you like, and you're like, well, that's a good little riff or a good little hook or a funny little turnaround or whatever. And so I put that down. And then I'm like, I put a few more things on it. And I put a few... And then I'm like, is this just shit? <laughs> oh, and then I'm like, doubt. I'm stuck on it for sometimes half an hour, sometimes three months. What's the hardest and, part about finishing a song? Is it the lyrics or? Well, I always do the lyric. Well, I generally do the lyrics last. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the finishing it bit, like once I've got all the bits and I'm comfortable with them all and, and stuff, then, then I'm 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 fine. Like I can I can chuck that all together really quickly, and I, I really enjoy doing that. But the middle bit where I'm kind of scratching my head over it, that's the bit where what I've had to do over the last few years is go. Well, pretty much all the other stuff that I've done has ended up coming out. You know, I'm pleased with it. Um, it's not perfect. None of it's perfect, but. You know, I end up being pleased with it. So that that's just part of the process. By the Thinking middle bit, do you mean do you mean the bridge? No, 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 no. The middle part of writing the song. Oh, so okay. if if you wake up on a morning and you've got this little hook and you fire up your laptop and you put it down and put a little drum beat behind it and lay a bit of bass down and then you write, okay, that's a cool verse. And then I'm like, I'll sit and try and write a chorus for it, and everything I write is rubbish. 
Um, and then I'll come up with like a riff section or something. I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. But this chorus is now. I just have to kind of be confident in 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 my own abilities to turn it round and and make something of it because it usually worked out okay once I get through that bit. So sometimes it's just a question of putting a bit of a chorus on or a, a hook or a melody or, or whatever the part is and just going, right, that's there now. I might completely change that in a week or in an hour. But for now, that, that'll that that'll be that part. Uh, or like, I'll you know, the chords will stay, but I'll come up with a much better melody or hook line or idea. So it's just like having, that, having a bit more confidence to go, I just need and then it'll be okay. The general the process, uh, the pro- I mean, I could go hours for talking about the process. But generally, you come up with a title first. How how do you begin a song? The songwriting well, tips for everybody out there. <laughs> songwriting tips from Britain's least successful songwriter. Songwriting tips um, from the great Chris, Chris Catalyst. <laughs> well, because I, um, I talked to Donovan, Donovan Leach, you know, Donovan, the... Um, Sunshine yeah, cool. Superman. He oh, gave, good, a, man. yeah, he gave a good tip. He said, "Take your favorite song and play the lick, and then play it backwards." <laughs> um, do you know? I've been meaning for the longest time to kind of try some of that stuff. To go like, right, okay, what's a song that I really like? All right, uh, let's say. Um, uh, a song that you wouldn't normally expect, maybe like "Drop Dead Gorgeous" by Republica. Do you know that one? Was that or, or what was big in America? Uh, um, Smoke on the water. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, or like, like you know, smells like Teen Spirit. Right, fuck's yeah. like, or whatever. Yeah. And go, and go like, right, okay. That's got a tried and tested formula, so that the riff goes dang a dang 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 ba bam 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 bam. So go in like dang a dang dang a dang 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 a dang dang a dang dang. You know, and then having a verse that's like you know the verse in Teen Spirit goes down down. Maybe have it go down down or something. And the thing with that is that I think then you would you know put put the whole song together, and then you'd be like no, this intro is rubbish. And then come up with an intro that's better for the actual song that you've written. It seems contrived, but it's something that I've always fancied, like having a bit of a smoke and doing. (laughs) Sometimes you can listen to a song, you can hear a song on the radio or somewhere, and then turn that song off and have the song going through your head and have nothing but that song going through your head for eight hours. And by the end of the eight hours, you got like a different song that's similar to that song in your head. Yeah. Never, yeah. Do, never done that. I'm not, I'm not I sure. Have. I've, I've done that. That's um, yeah. I mean, there you go. There's your tune. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't have a, 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 a specific uh, set process. You just pick up the guitar. You generally pick up the guitar. You do. You, you're dreaming in your sleep of a melody or. Some t- yeah, I mean, th- there's a song on the new album called Dead Man Walking, which was pretty much, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this tune in my head and it's got this sort of finger clicks percussion thing. I basically woke up with this, um, with that in my head. That's, that's very rare that that's ever happened, but that happened and I was like, fuck, where's my phone? And I've got this, I've got this note in my phone somewhere that's like... <laughs> Do you, um, do you carry a phone I, around and like use voice memos and does hum a melody? All, all the time, yeah, all the time. Um, uh, I always love yeah, hearing yeah. different different songwriters' uh, process of how they write tunes. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, me. I think I think you know Brian Eno had had some good ideas in Oblique Strategies mm-hmm. where like he talks about like um, you know I but my automatic thing is to reach for a guitar and and you know. I play a G chord or a D chord, and um, and 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 that's that's great and everything. But I think what, one of the issues with that is that you end up sort of falling into formulas, and I like certain chord pack patterns and progressions and stuff. And it's great to actually just you know, I, I sort of know my way around a keyboard. I'm I'm not a, a good piano player or or keyboard player by any stretch of the imagination, but I can you know I can hang out, hang out chords and stuff. And sometimes it's good to just go. Right, I'm going to write. I'm going to get this keyboard out and 
do something different today. Um, and, and sometimes the most interesting stuff comes from that, you know. Um, sometimes technology. I bought this great pedal, an electroharmonic synth 9, which uh, has all sorts of weird sounds in it that I would normally never, ever use. Um, because generally it would be in an analog synth that would cost thousands, and I'm not very good at plugins and computers and stuff. Uh, so with this synth thing, I could play notes into it, and it would be like, wow, that's an interesting kind of a riff that I've never really heard before, of, or at least I've never really heard me do before. Um, so, yeah, like I think sometimes using technology and other things that you wouldn't normally do, percussion, and, and again, that's, that's something that, I, that I've really got into over the last few years with maybe solo stuff, which is taking beats and splicing them up and editing them, fucking them about, and and making beats and, and sometimes making beats out of a bit on my album at the, the table that I'm sitting at now. What do you use um, to make the beats? Well, sometimes it'll be existing drums that I've got. Sometimes it'll be loops that I've downloaded. Sometimes it's Apple loops. And, and sometimes like on this, on the last song on my album, the, um, uh, the kick drum was me thumping on this table. And then, and so I did that and then I did a, Clap. And then you loop oh, that some you loop on. that somehow? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, mess with it so it doesn't sound like a fucking idiot hammering on a table. What's your home um, what's your home DAW or whatever you call it, recording program of choice? I use Adobe Audition, which nobody else in the world uses. For that's what I used. To, that's what I used to edit my podcast. If I if I ever exactly. well, not what I, I don't edit the podcast, but that's what I use to uh, export the podcast. So I, I I worked in radio before my, before I got the job with the sisters. I was a radio producer for three years, and um, and so I learned Audition or Cool Edit, as it was known then. Uh-huh. Um, and I just, I just knew it inside out. Uh, Are there drum loops in Adobe Audition? There's not. Right? No, 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 not at all. A lot of the stuff I download, or there's websites where there's free, anyone can use them type loops. So you and, can download a loop into Adobe Audition, and then you just like cut and paste for to loop it. Yeah, cut and paste it, stretch it, put reverb on it, huh, glitch, okay. make it glitch. You know, add other stuff i love that. one of the things that i'm really into is the sound of two drum loops going on at the same time on either side of the sort of um stereo field and um and again just you know kind of manipulating it in ways that maybe you don't even really hear but kind of it's a it's an interesting uh, feel for me that especially if you've got drums down the middle and then you've got a loop either side that's doing something different that's adding to the groove and and kind of fucking you up. It's it's interesting to me that so stuff. So you can it add plugins and stuff to Adobe Audition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not good at home, at audio workstations. Multi track recording is not my forte. But I, well, it's, it's 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 one of those things. I mean, again, much like I was saying about Kemper and Axe Effects or Max and PCs. Some of my music making friends are like, you've got to fucking learn Logic, or you've got to learn right, Pro yeah. Tools. I can do a bit in Logic, I can do a bit in Pro Tools, but the last time I sat down with uh, Pro Tools, I was I was like, I need to properly learn this. But it was sort of it became the enemy of um, progress because every every time I wanted to record something, I was like, right, okay, uh, so I will press this one, and then I have to enable that and. Then I have to tell it that it's coming from there, and then I then I need to make sure that it's not. Whereas with audition, simply because I know it, I can go right, hit record, it records. I'm probably so you spend I'm probably boring people with this, but uh, can you punch <laughs> in in Adobe Audition? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a punch in uh, um, command in Adobe. In... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it, basically again like like everything. The kind of the, the the regular functions are pretty much all the same. You know, it does the same thing as Pro Tools. It does the same thing as Logic. It just does it in a slightly different way. It doesn't do the MIDI stuff that you can do in Logic and Pro Tools, or in Cubase, or in whatever. But but um, it it just comes down to what you know. I had someone telling me recently, oh, but it doesn't sound as good as Pro Tools. And I'm just like, it's just not true. You know, you're feeding it a signal, and it's you know. 
it, there's there's a lot of bollocks talked about um well about everything frankly but about um about uh recording software and what's good and what's right and you know at the end of the day if you haven't got a good song or a fucking exciting guitar part going through it then it you know you can have all the bells and whistles in the world and the latest pro tools and an incredible um preamp and glassy interfaces and all this shit but if it's crap then it doesn't matter (laughs) that concludes this segment of home recording with chris capel or chris capel chris 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 catalyst (laughs) oh that was that's great man i I love talking about this geeked out shit um yeah, so, so thank you for doing this. What's the plan? So the rest of the day you're going to go to, uh, you're going to have a sushi with a, with a friend. I'm going out for sushi for my friends, for my friend's all you, birthday. All you can eat sushi. All you can eat sushi. What's so that cost? Um, I think it's like 30 quid each or 30 does it, pounds each. Does it include alcohol? No, oh. and that's going to add significantly to the bill. Yeah. Uh, but it was my friend's birthday on the 1st of January. And for her birthday, I said I'd take her out for a sushi dinner. And um, uh, and then we just kept not being able to find a date to do it. And then we finally got a date to do it about three weeks ago. And I got COVID again. <sighs> um, so that, that called it off once again. Uh-huh. So anyway. Well, tonight, good thing tonight, you had 12 shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so do you starve yourself all day to get to prepare for an all you can eat? Cause that's what I do. Absolutely. And sometimes I'll smoke some pots. I'll get the munchies, you know, I'll get super <laughs> hungry too. That would, that would be good. But I'm, the thing is, I love smoking weed, but it's very much a solitary activity for me. Yeah. yeah. But like, just, I, for hung for medicinal purposes, just to get medicinal hungry. hunger. Yeah. yeah. I, I see that completely. All right, Chris, Chris Catalyst, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Let everybody no, know that uh, Chris, you heard Chris Catalyst on this show. Let him know so that he doesn't know, think he wasted an hour and 17 minutes of his time. <laughs> so it's Chris Catalyst, go, ChrisCatalyst.com. That's me. And, and it's on all the Spotify's and the Apples and the, all those things. I'll put uh, links to where you can find it all, all of all things Chris Catalyst on the show notes at rockandrollgeek.com. So will you send me yeah. send me some songs and let me know which two I can play on this episode? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Um, it's uh, Yeah, I, I hope you like it. I, I'm sure I will. I've liked everything you've done so far, so I'm sure I'll like it. The album's nice. called Thank Mad in England. That's the right. first song is called uh, Emergency. You can hear that out already, and I played it on the last episode. And you got four more videos coming out in this Three more, three, three more, more videos, so four, okay. four total. Um, uh, I actually just saw the, the last one today, um, or the first draft of the last one today. I'm, I'm very pleased with them all. Um, there's some weird and wonderful stuff on there, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to get it out there. What are, What's the next uh, paying gig you got? Well, actually, funnily enough, I'm, I'm back doing the sisters. Um, oh, good. Um albeit I'm running the drum machines uh, for them, which is a bit of exclusive info for you. Um, so how does it, what's involved in running the drum machine? Are you on stage? Yeah. So the, with the sisters, that's always been the nurse to the doctor. Dr. Avalanche is the, um, the sister's drum machine and has been the only uh, consistent member along with Andrew since 1981. Um but uh, but he needs a nurse, so um, I'm I'm the nurse for this next tour. Uh, uh, so that's that's going to be an interesting one. Um, it should be good, I think. It'll be fun. It'll be a different different kind of experience. Uh, so uh, you know, and I like I'm all about different kind of experience. When is that starting? Uh, this time next week. Oh, all good. You, you got a paycheck coming soon. Then. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So and make the ca- keep- house payment. Keep, yeah, keep us out of trouble. Keep us in beer. Keep us in beer and sushi. That's that's the main thing. Yes, exactly. All right, Chris Catalyst, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael, for sparing the time. All right, thanks. I'll- Lots of love. Bye now. All right, bye. Cheers, mate. There you go, Chris Catalyst. I don't know what he's going to send me, but I'm going to follow up with this with a song. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to stop this once I get the music from Chris Catalyst. This is the only time I'm going to be editing. I, this is the only t- actual the only time I do edit Rock and Roll Geek Show is when um, 
something like this happens. So I'm going to go, I'm going to record a beginning bit after Chris sends me the songs. I'll play a song and then we'll jump back to this end and I'll say, thank you for listening, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll uh, close out with a song. All right. So I'm going to pause this here and I'll talk to you soon, friends. Okay. I am back. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Chris Catalyst, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I hope you uh, let him know you heard about him on the Rock and Roll Geek Show. And uh, I'm sure he will appreciate it, and he won't think he wasted all of his time. I will post links to where you can find everything about Chris Catalyst at show notes at rockandrollgeek.com. Thank you for listening. As usual, it's a value for value. So if you get any value out of this, I'd appreciate it if you can contribute with what you think it's worth to you, friends. If it's not worth anything to you, don't contribute anything. But if you if you get any value out of it, you will be really helping the show out by uh, supporting the show. Thank you for listening, friends. Rockandrollgeek.com is where you can find this show. You can email me, rockandroll at gmail. Ugh. Rockandrollgeek at gmail.com. Find me on the Facebook, R&R Geek. Find me on the Instagram, rockandrollgeek. Don't ask. Find me on the Twitter, R&R Geek. Rock and Roll Geek Facebook group, you know all the ways to reach me. Thank you for listening, friends. I'll talk to you very soon. I'm going to close out with a um, another song from the new album, Mad in England, from Chris Catalyst. This is the last song in the album, and usually the last song is my always my favorite. Not always, but most of the time it's my favorite song because it has a little bit of introspection, and I think this one does as well. This is called Dead Man Walking. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening, friends. Beneath the shadow trees, a footpath so roughly trod, the new suede and the breeze to carry me home to God. This date set in the diary, my sins would be atoned. There would be no inquiry, and soon I would be gone. A quandary at a beauty spot, to reason or to run. My mother cried an awful lot, my father got his gun.
gathering slowly to pick at my remains. I camouflage my ugly scars and dust away my fall. But I'd rather have a broken heart than not have one.